Salvador Dali. Few names in all the world are better known. Few celebrities are more celebrated. Salvador Dali himself is the master of those celebrations. Is he a master of painting as well as felicity? His fanatical admirers, whom he professes to despise, are sure that he belongs to the ages. Others find his work merely facile, sporadically modish, incurably academic. Dali himself claims to be no more than a second-rate painter, but he's also certain that among all the painters of Astrid, Salvador Dali is the best. Salvador Dali deserves the attention he solicits. This reactionary anarchist, monarchist, this prince of paradox, this frenzied advocate of every kind of censure claims to be the freest individual of his time. Is all this empty bragging, mad babbling, or the simple truth that Salvador Dali Speak for himself. This morning, open the window and look the beach of Portugal. Plenty of television cameras, movies, electronic devices. And this, for me, is the proof of the craziness of Dali and the elf of my inspiration gala obtained one complete triumph in the world. If Dali's English is a bit surprising, it deserves an explanation. Now, since I explain everybody, Dali speak in this moment in Dalinian English. Uh, uh, it's not necessary that everybody understand my speech, because my ideas is so plenty or substantial elements that only see somebody catch a little particle, a little piece of my speech, this is absolutely sufficient. Dali has, as a matter of fact, published a method of teaching us to speak English correctly. The surrealism of Arles, of pop Arles, Abstract expressionism is the result of the craziness of Galan and Dali, and this craziness lives for three years against everyone in this little room. Since 1930, Dali and Gala, his one and only, have lived in a fishing village on the coast of Spain 
not far from the French border. Their house is built up around a fisherman's shanty, which Dolly bought with the money from the sale of his first painting. In this room, Dali, Bork, Pain. Nec le complete Dalinian philosophy. Love Gala and Dream with Gala. In this corner is one table, table only for dinner and for food. But in this table, also is one little easel and create the more fantastic painting. This painting is created in this little corner. moment of the divine Dali pass through the self structure the back of Lydia de Cataquet in the moment the most tragical and pathetic of my daily life the moment of my family expels Dali of the family believe Catali and Gala is two people completely crazy. But one statement is necessary. The only difference between one crazy man and Dali is very simple. Dali is not crazy. The Asinto Dali was born at 8.45 on the morning of May 11th, 1904, the son of a liberal notary and a great art lover, and of a mother whom he worshipped, and whose death when he was 16 was an acute bereavement. He says that in order to affirm his personality, he had to fight from the time he was born against the memory of another Salvador, an elder brother, who had died prematurely. All the eccentricities that I habitually perpetrate, he says, are the tragic constant of my life. I want to prove that I am not the dead brother, but the living brother. By killing my brother, I immortalize myself. In 1821, he was admitted to the Academy of Fine Arts of Madrid. Five years later, after a succession of scandals, he was expelled. But the family of Dali no react in this way and because the craziness of Dali expels Dali of the family and Dali arrived in this little room. Now Dali is sick because Livia, one crazy woman also, protect me. We're told that his exacerbated cult of his ego, his innate love of intellectual and moral subversion, amazed and astounded his first accomplices, Federico Garcia Lorca and Luis Buñuel. But in 1929, the Surrealists enthusiastically saluted him as one of their own. By 1930, he settled in Paris and settled down to the job of transcribing his dreams and visions and to systematically scandalize the people around him. But it's very normal that nobody understands Ali because myself never understand my book. Never Dali understand one painting of Dali because Dali only creates enigmas. And America Love, everything is mysterious and enigmatic.
Salvador Dali finally agreed last summer to the filming of this portrait of Salvador Dali. Thus, the director and his crew were obliged by this great occasion to bring that technical equipment to Spain, to that special Spanish corner of the Mediterranean which the master has made so very much his own. and exhausting journey brought the movie makers to Dolly's door. He seemed wary. Cameras and tape recorders were turned on. But turned on was what the divine Dolly was not. Salvador Dolly, would you like to speak to us about your childhood? No! Salvador Dolly, would you like to speak to us about your painting? No! Salvador Dolly, Will you answer at least one question? No! Salvador Dali, do you or do you not want to do this film? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Salvador Dali, do you consider that birth is a traumatic experience? You know, every time Dali is dispositioned, Dali is becoming angry. Because this is a complete idiotic question. Yes! 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 yes, yes. Traumatism. You have, it appears, a very clear idea of your prenatal life. Yes. Absolutely. Because already the Dr. Otto Rahm write the most uh, eminent book about this matter, and the title is Tetraumatism of Birth. And I remember in the most minute details the image, the images, the most phosphorescent, the most paradisiac, the most truculent, and the most Phosphines and angelic visions, says Dolly. My intra uterine life had the color of hellfire. It was soft, motionless, and warm and sticky. My most splendid vision was that of two eggs in a frying pan, phosphorescent and blue tinged. The image of an initial state that my whole imaginative life tends to reconstruct symbolically, just as it tends to become the horrible trauma of birth which flings us into the hard, cold, and frightfully real world. Dali says that he likes to assimilate his birth to that of the Greek demigods, like the offspring of Leda and the swan. Yes, because mythological point of view, Leda love with two different people. One, Jupiter. The second one, Tenda. Jupiter produced one Ec divine, immortal, in this act, born Gala, Helen, my wife, and the divine Dioscur Salvador Dali. <laughs> Dali 
involved with any kind of traumatism. Little blood, symbolic blood. And milk, again, milk of today, flour, and some symbolic fish of Mediterranean people. This is the blood of Gala and the blood of divine Tabu. In the second act of Tendar, also two twins, but these two twins is absolutely mortal. Use your heart to think everybody. In one, two important twins, Gala and Dali, and the second one, usual people. Thus, Castor and Pollux, Helen and Clytemnestra, are born for the second time on the solitary beach of Port Ligat in Catalonia, on the coast of Spain. <laughs> Case where Dali lives is a tourist town, and Dali is its chief tourist attraction. People come by the busload to look at him, and he keeps himself very amiably on display. There are some who condemn this exhibitionism. Others, who may or may not know him better, claim that the genial show-off is only a mask hiding an extremely diffident and timid man. Fisherman will speak. Hola, Salvador. This is where we fishermen of Port Ligat have seen our friend Salvador at work every morning for the past 40 or more years. an eccentric life of divine Dali, no one single moment the specter of death disappears. Death is all time present in my precious life, and perhaps this is the reason of my most actual obsession the modern hibernation. Our friend Salvador is about to wake up his pianist.
Salvador Dali sets himself up to be a magician. There are many kinds of magicians. And Dali would have us know that he is all of them. Not only a wizard, a command of real mysteries, but a charlatan. The sort of wonder worker who sets up his turn on a street corner, the market square. A sublime harlequin. A high priest, and also a shameless dealer in hanky-panky and sidearm snooker. presented the world with a new idea in men's clothing. This was a coat of black cloth with four buttons on the sleeve and on the front, 41 liqueur glasses, each containing creme de menthe, a fly, and a straw. This, he said, was his aphrodisiac jacket. It's not quite clear what he's trying to tell us here. It's quite all right with Dolly. Mystification is his way of life. This Caduce is the most extraordinary surrealist object because it's concentric and eccentric in the same time. Every word we know, Dali, perestesic, hysterical, violent, but sometimes Dali becoming the same called the divine Hermes, one creature plenty of serenity, and in this case, bring me chocolate, chocolate, big chocolate. Uh, papier papier chocolate. Uh, le pepper, you know, le, le, le pepper for enveloping le, le chocolate. It is the name, le pepper. Uh, metallic, me, any kind of metal, brilliant and soft. <laughs> Silvering. Inventions of Salvador Dali's are sometimes conceived in the spirit of a magical transformation, sometimes as an act of discovery. And here we have the master discovering the face of death in a plastic bottle. Macabre, macabre effect. 
inside the eternal body of the Venus of Milo. Here again we have Salvador Dali attacking Greek sculpture and giving a lesson to pop artists. And now our hero, plunging courageously into the mysteries of the microscope and trick photography, integrates himself symbolically with the ultra-pure unities of a drop of milk filmed at 3,000 images per second. fisherman who's a childhood friend, Dali often visits this queerly grandiose and tormented spot of the Pyrenees come down to drown in the sea. stems from its realization that time is working against it. fears of madness. paints the things that are behind things. he discovers Voltaire's bust. Double image, guessing game images, multiple images, visual punk.
soft self-portrait of Dali is absolutely necessary tell everybody Dali is the first inventor of the soft furniture. And the first soft bibliotech is created 35 years ago and today becoming the symbol of pop art. In the uh, philosophy, the Linian philosophy, the reason, the more important of reasons, everything is soft, is because everything is necessary, possible, becoming possible, comestible. Every book is necessary digest in the most ultra material and fetishistic manner. In the life of Dali, everything is necessary becoming visceral. For this reason, Dali never write books, but the Zenka San John in the famous apocalypse the book for a similar everything is similar. This furniture is not so soft in other occasions, but is very soft in a spiritual meaning because it's the more precious furniture of Gala and inside every of these books is Right for Dali and contains the most intimate, strange pop art is synonymous of Dali. Because everybody remember my first definition of painting. Painting is photographic, glorious photographic in technical work made by an of the more strange image of the irrationality, concrete irrationality. No, no, no figuration, no abstraction, no presence, no no method. And the definition, exact definition of paranoiac critical method is this. Paranoiac critical method equal of systematic delirium of interpretation, interpretation for the complete triumphal objectivation of the more delirious, crazy, and violent, irrational ideas. Dali, obeying his own irrefutable brand of logic, left the makers of this film fairly breathless when he suddenly demanded that there be created for him a six meter long shirt. This shirt, he said, would be the purest symbol, denuded of any sort of significance. The splendid Catalan hog, and is, according to Dolly, Dolly's truest symbol. The noise of the sacred animal, remember something very important, And Dali love greenish pink. Please paint this animal in green. The hog, he says, is also a symbol of perfection. Like Dali, the hog advances without ever drawing back from the garbage heap of modern life which he digests and unceasingly restores for the greatest intellectual and physical satisfaction of his contemporaries.
Uh, Dolly points out that the symbol of the hog was adopted by King Charles V to replace all other symbols of perfection when he changed the inscription of the escutcheon of Spain from non plus ultra to plus ultra, ever farther, ever higher, ever better. The last afternoon, one very gentle Swedish newspaper man uh, tell me, Mr. Lali, of this significance of the sequence with one greenish pick. And the answer is very simple because this greenish pick is myself, is my symbol. Greenish pick, not an heroic and super gelatinous soft pick. After three, Lali, the most dread. For Salvador Dali, the Chinese did nothing but invent gunpowder. He gives importance only to the Mediterranean civilization of which he considers himself the supreme heir. This being so, one is informed that the Greek folds over the spine of the pig can only add grist to the mill of his interpretive delirium. When he draws Gala, Dali truly takes himself for Vermeer, and in the image of the master of Delft, sacrifices himself to the cult of maddening love for his sole model. I wish we could hear something from Gala herself, but it seems she remained ever sphinx-like. No comment from Gala. Turn a little, look the sky, the clouds. Now, and smile a little. This divine, Mervia. One other dot, yellow dot. You know now, like it, make the more in it, listen for in honor of American people. Because the little leave, one other dot, leave. 25 years in America and discover that American people like it better of everything, like it dots. Because the dots, the pointillism is the glory of American people. American people discover the matter is discontinuous. Plenty of pimesons, electrons, antiprotons. And peace is the more violent of any conception because peace, elemental particle, la apoteosis of peace, is the atomic bomb. America is the more vital, the more violent, and the most creative of every people in the planet. Peace. Optic object is the father of op art and consists in the superposition of parabolic lenses and these lenses exist in the more perfect manner in the edges of flies. This object 
is perhaps the beginning of one new era in modern painting. The alchemic meeting of pop art, pop art, quantilism, action painting, touchism, and also Messonnier's pompierism will perhaps, it is claimed, make Dali's tuna fishing a painting as important as the soft watches of some 30 years back. This is the symbol of today new mutation of young musicians people of action painting and last developments of hysterical genius. It's very astonishing one bureaucrat with this kind of wings, but for the new generation of pop and pop and LSD strong creatures, is absolutely necessary this aspect almost archangelic because in the Dalian conception one artist is one strange character plenty of superstitions almost not completely masculine not completely feminine androgyn because the creativity of one genius more close of one angel, more close of one angel than one regular common man or one regular bureaucrat. The creative endeavors of Salvador Dali require preparatory and propitiatory rights more concerned with keeping his own legend alive than with the immortality of his work, Dali is at his best within the mystic circle of his admirers. True or false? He feels, he says, responsible for beatings, for what is exaggerated and paradoxical in beat nickers. He identifies with these young people who, through some sort of mutation, attempt to rid themselves of terrestrial slang. And so we are to have happening. Bam. This is coupled with the accomplishment of Salvador Dali's imperious desire, the essential motivation of this film, to paint the sky in his own image, that of the angel of extermination and redemption.
this man, in whom contradictorily, and I quote, all human experience is resumed. Hill man who sees, farther than all others, Salvador Dali knows himself to be the depository of the secret initiation of the future. throw off your spacesuit and long live Robin Hood and Tarzan. Give up this absurd voyage into space, down with Jules Bed. But run through our humble terrestrial dwelling. Long live the bicycle. Enrich your own internal richness. Long live the divine hog. Have only one goal, one desire, that to live and to live for a long time. Long live hibernation. Holy Grail is a noble thing, but cultivating our own garden is better. of an umbrella and a swaving machine on a dissecting table. is about the early years and escalating fame of Salvador Dali, one of the best known and most controversial artists of the 20th century. Dali died in 1989. His personality had become as well known as his paintings. He created his own museum in Spain, which draws crowds of tourists each year. His work continues to influence contemporary artists and the advertising. But this is also a film made during the writing of a biography about Salvador Dali by the Irish author Ian Gibson. And the great man himself. Bonjour, Senor Dali. Como estamos? The problem for any biographer is to separate fact from fiction, particularly difficult with someone like Dali, who loved to cultivate confusion. Only idiot people tell the truth. Only what people? 
idiotic. Idiotic people? people. <laughs> Only stupid people tell yeah. the truth. Because myself, I'm very intelligent, never tell the truth. Never tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> The idea of writing a biography of Dali came to me in 1986. I wanted to talk to him about a biography I'd written about his great friend, the poet Federico García Lorca. Televisión Española dispone de un buen testimonio. Dali was desperately weak, but he told me fascinating things. And as I looked at him, as I listened to him, as I heard his hand knocking on the, on the table, I could see that there was a terrible tragedy behind the mask, which was already a crumbling mask. As I left the room, feeling rather sad, because clearly he wasn't going to live for very much longer, I decided that I might begin to investigate his life. Tremendous to see this huge German monster churning out these Dali stamps in this, in this mint. I mean, this place is sort of magic. I think Dali would have really enjoyed it. And to see his great masturbator, hundreds and hundreds of masturbators. Dali was the greatest exhibitionist the world has ever known. And I would think probably one of the greatest masturbators. I think it's terrific. He put masturbation on the map. I think it's very important that masturbation should be on the map, an acceptable human activity. Gala, of course. Dali's Russian wife, Gala, was an enigmatic person who never spoke publicly about their relationship. But he would not be the Dali we know without her. Gather Case, the isolated Catalan seaside village on the Costa Brava, was an equally important source of inspiration. Dali's family spent their summers in Gather Case. As a child, Dali grew to love the village and its surroundings with fanatical intensity. I realized that my first task as his biographer was to explore his childhood paradise around the little house where the family came each year. When Dali was a child, there was no road, so they could walk straight down onto the beach from the house. I mean, they were right at the edge of the sea. It was a very sort of lonely place, away from the center of Cadaqués, a private beach. And here Dali discovered a tiny big world that fascinated him for the whole of his life. Onto the mineral impassiveness of this Cadaqués landscape, I projected, day after day, all the accumulated and chronically unsatisfied tension of my erotic and sentimental life. I alone knew the exact itinerary of the shadows as they traced their anguishing course around the bosom of the rocks. To start with, there were these extraordinary rocks which can be sort of pitted very easily by the wind and by the, by the waves. They suggest all sorts of things. You look at them and suddenly you see a little face or a little animal and of course they change with the light. The place looks completely different at every point in the day. I think also fascinated Dali, these metamorphoses which occur constantly among these rocks, which I think uh, influence his whole way of looking at the world. So that Dali's double images, for which he's so famous, uh, I think derive from this landscape. These sea urchins, it was Dali's favorite food, and when they wanted to celebrate something, they had a sea urchin feast, a garotada, the greatest food in the world. Hey, I've just seen that. A terribly important movie just seen. That is a little fish that fascinated Dali and which terrified him at the same time. It's called a slubberer, a babosa in Catalan. I have just looked at the face of the slobberer, I cried out to my father. And it was exactly the same as the grasshoppers, that loathsome insect, horror, nightmare, and hallucinating folly of Salvador Dali's life. The secret life is a minefield for the unwary biographer. But one thing that does ring true is the influence on Dali of his formidable father, filmed here by Luis Buñuel, no less, in 1930. Dali was born and brought up in the sophisticated market town of Figueras, 
20 miles inland from Calacase, where his father was a successful lawyer. When Dali was eight, the family moved into a fine apartment further down the street. And up here on top, uh, Dali had his own private kingdom. He always liked to be on top of things, and he was on top here. This was his place, and nobody else was allowed to come up. And in here, and I find this really very moving, this was Dali's first studio, his very first studio, which is a wash house, an abandoned wash house. And he used to sit in here in this tub, and when it was very hot in the summer, to fill the bath with water, sit in there naked, and draw. It would be interminable for me to narrate all that I lived through inside my laundry tray. But one thing is certain, namely that the first pinches of salt and the first grains of pepper of my humor were born there. And I was vaguely, confusedly aware that I was in the process of playing at being a genius. Oh, Salvador Dali, you know it now. If you play a genius, you become one. This, of course, was Dali embellishing history at the age of 38. Today, it takes half an hour to drive to Cadacase from Figueras. But when Dali was young, it was very cut off indeed. Cadacase was the perfect subject for a fledgling painter, and one of Dali's childhood friends still lives there. The light of Cadacase probably made the funny colors of his painting, because his painting had a sort of very bright colors, but not the usual coloring, mm -hmm. something which he made up. It's an invention of his. And he's done it since he was a child, because I remember the first things he painted. He painted on cardboard or bits and pieces that he found in the house. And the coloring was beautiful. Now, is it true that your father gave him his first box of paints? Yes, that's quite true. Father said, well, if you like to paint, I'll give you a, a box of colors, and so he gave him his first box. Very so that's not true about Siegfried Burman giving... Giving the... No, no, that's not true. It was your father. It's a quite big lie. A big lie. A big lie. <laughs> I think we better talk about that later on. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Shall we go and see some... Yes, paint? I'll show you the Dalis, and then I'll show you the Burman painting, too. Lovely. The problem is that a lot of the big lies were propagated by I Dali himself. I, I think that Rosa Maria's memories are probably more reliable. She herself has lived here all her life, translating English and American novels into Spanish. This is me. That's you. And this is my guardian angel. Yeah, how did Dali become your guardian angel? <laughs> because he wanted to buy me. To buy you? Yeah. And mother said that it wouldn't be practical because I had to be taken care of. And he was very young. He was just six years older than I. And that he wouldn't probably be able to do it. But then she would name him my guardian. And please uh, promise that you'll always take care of her and you'll always watch over her. And he did. Now tell me, Rosa, about, about the grasshoppers. <coughs> what's, all this, what's all this about the grasshoppers? Oh, that, that was a terror. He was horrified of the grasshoppers, but horrified. Uh, and are those the creatures that appear in Dali's paintings? On the mouth, stuck to the mouth of the great yes. masturbator? You know yes, well, I mean, they have a mouth and they have tooth, probably teeth, but they are big like this, big ones. Yes. We used to do that because they, we like to have the, the grasshoppers catch our noses. <laughs> but then Salvador was horrified of this. He pushed the children, ah! It was terror, pure terror even when he was grown up. I'm standing on the prow of the peninsula in Cadaqués, Esortel. And across the bay is one of the most picturesque lighthouses, the lighthouse at Calanance, and which marks the southern confine of his childhood paradise. It's August, it's hot, it's sweaty, it's sexy. Uh, there are lots of bodies uh, lying around, bodies that Dali would have enjoyed uh, watching down here on the rocks. Some are big, some are small, some are in between. But from where I'm standing, they all look pretty good. In his early paintings, Dali experimented with different styles. But voyeurism was to be a constant theme. 
I knew it was very important for me to talk to Antoni Pichot, who helped Dali in his very last years, and who had put me in touch with him in the first place. He was from the family of cultured Bohemians who befriended Dali as a boy. It was his uncle, Ramon Pichot, whose impressionist paintings had first inspired the young artist. Pero realmente, Antonio, estoy viendo que la relación de los Dalí con, con los Pichot es fundamental en la vida de Salvador y en su obra. ¿eh? Ah, no, fundamental. Que sin vosotros sí. no hay Dalí. Vamos, Dalí es diferente. Bueno, Dalí hubiera sido exactamente Dalí, pero fue una gran influencia la que tuvo la familia Pichot en él y que le dio impulso y eso Dalí lo reconoció toda su vida. Que la, eh, no solamente el Pepito y la familia Pichot, sino también la pintura de Ramón Pichot, el impresionismo. Ah, ¿Eh? Un ciprés. Un ciprés sí, he estado mirando aquí al ciprés. Yo vivo junto al ciprés. Es, es un ciprés maravilloso. ¿Y Dalí eh, apreciaba este ciprés? Bueno, eh, cada vez que venía aquí, lo primero que hacía antes de saludar a la familia ni a nadie, saludaba al ciprés. No me digas. Le daba un gran abrazo. Y entonces decía una cosa que yo dudo un poco de que fuese cierta. Decía, lo he plantado yo. Pero como todas las cosas que de, de Dalí que eran un poco a veces dudosas, tenía una base de, de, de realidad. Seguramente él debió vivir los días que con Pepito hacían labores de jardinería aquí en Cataquís, en los primeros años del, del siglo. Este es Pepito ya mayor, con el niño Dalí, y, y es, el que, es el primero que dijo que Dalí era genial, que, que Dalí esto lo recordó toda su vida. Y este, esta silla que veis aquí es, es exactamente esta, esta mía. ¿Esta silla? Yo soy completamente, completamente la misma. Sí, siéntate así. Bueno, vamos a ver. ¿Ves? Fíjate. Es, es Creo que... que Ana María tenía la espalda más bonita que la mía. ¿verdad? Es que era la modelo... Mira, aquí está. Aquí, aquí también. Sí. Siempre aparece Ana María en, todo, en todos los momentos. Era un personaje fascinante. Mira. Ana María Dalí, five years younger than Salvador, was his principal model until the mid-twenties. It was an almost incestuous relationship, and she felt cruelly rejected when later displaced by others in his art and affection. No me caigas encima, Antonio. Lo procuraré. Que caigas en... The Molle de la Torre impressed me as a magic spot. It was made on purpose for the continuation of my waking fantasies and dreams. Uh. This catalog weighs two kilos. Kilos. The height of the summit of the tower where I found myself exceeded everything I had imagined. Of course, Dali, who was only 12 at the time, remembered the tower as being much taller than it really was. Dali linked this spot to an image that occurs again and again throughout his work, the wooden crutch. In the center of the terrace was standing, slightly leaning towards the right, my rain-soaked crutch, which now projected an elongated and sinister shadow on the tiling lighted by red sun rays. Since then, that anonymous crutch will remain for me till the end of my days, a symbol of death and the symbol of resurrection. Pero él siempre relacionaba la muleta con la impotencia, ¿no? Con todo. Con esas formas flácidas que sí. se apoyan en... Sí. En muletas. Sí, sí, con la impotencia y con la falta también de, de seguridad, ¿verdad? Con la inseguridad. Mm -hmm. era, era un signo de, de, de apoyo, era, era algo necesario. Todo lo que es flácido, todo lo que es blando, sí. necesita un apoyo. You, you like crutches a lot. Yes, because it's one symbol of impotency. Impotence. Only, yes. Only the great people realize sensational as heaven is, is impotent, you know? Right. Bravo. Bravo, bravo. Barcelona was the most sophisticated city in Spain, a sort of small Paris by the sea. Dali's mother came from there, and Dali often visited it as a child and adolescent. 
He loved the strange soft buildings by Antonio Gaudi. In 1922, having completed his state baccalaureate, Dali was sent by his ambitious father to study painting at Madrid's Royal Academy School. He stayed at the famous student's residence, the most culturally advanced university hostel in the country. His fellow students included the poet Federico García Lorca, the future filmmaker Luis Buñuel, and José Bello, known to his friends as Pepín, the last survivor of the group. ¿Cuántos años tienes? <laughs> Más o menos. ¿90? 90. La misma edad de Dalí, exactamente igual. Naciste al mismo año, ¿no? El mismo, un día antes, un día después, un día. El año 1904. Cuatro. Y, y un día pasé por la habitación, que era el segundo pabellón, la planta baja, la planta baja, pasé por su habitación, y estaba la puerta abierta, y estaba él dentro, y me metí. Estaban allí porque estaba todo el, el suelo lleno de dibujos y las paredes y tal. Y le dije, esto es tuyo, estos son, dijo, sí, sí, son. Y yo lo estoy viendo, y me parecieron estupendos. Y la iba vestido con una... Bueno, llevaba una melena negra, una boina de punto, pero que se metía hasta las orejas, y una chaqueta de terciopelo negro. Y vosotros ibais muy correctamente vestidos. ¿no? Normales, normales. No, correctos, normales. No se prescindía de la corbata nunca. Uh -huh. Ibamos con corbata siempre. Te ruego que me, que me expliques un poco, porque Dalí, claro, es conocido mundialmente como el gran exhibicionista y tal, y Dalí, y tal y cual, pero tú has dicho... Eso es la reacción, la reacción a su timidez. Ese, esa audacia de la que ha presumido y ha pasado a la posteridad, esa audacia de Dalí, ese, ese desgarro de Dalí, eso es la lucha contra su propia timidez. Y Dalí era un tímido absolutamente, un tímido de arriba abajo. Tú has dicho que... Dalí era un tímido casi patológico. ¿Se expresaba en, en castellano? Sí, sí, sí. Sí, pero de una manera muy catalana o cómo era... ¿Tenía Exacto. problemas a la hora de decir cosas? No, así? no, 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 no tenía problemas. Él hablaba el español relativamente mal, pero como hablaba el catalán mal, y el francés mal, y el inglés mal, lo hablaba todos mal... <risa> Nos hablaba todos mal. Y escribía más. Y escribía peor. Claro. The group sent humorous notes and doodles to each other all the time. The letters and postcards have been published with commentaries by Rafael Santos Torruella, Spain's leading Dali expert, who's been enormously helpful to me in my work. Pero de todas maneras, con el otro viento, a ver lo que le va a pasar. Lo ha copiado aquí. Míralo, es él. Es de él, es de él, con un ojo tapado. Ah, sí, sí, con sí. Con un ojo sí. con el otro abierto, espiando lo que ve. Bueno, se reúnen en una plaza aquí bajo un farol. ¿Me muestras un segundo, por favor? Bajo un farol se sí. reúnen aquí en la, en la plaza. Aquí se, aquí se encuentran Maruja Mayo, la veréis más clara. Aquí Dalí, veis la, la melena en la sí, sombra, sí. igual que aquí. Y Buñuel aparece. Y aquí ¿no? Buñuel, míralo, con su. Aquí está Buñuel. Sí. El que le sigue es Buñuel, con las espaldas cuadradas. El que le sigue es Dalí, alto, con aquellas melenas que parecía una chica. Loco was the great friend and came to visit Dali and Cadacase in 1925 and again in 1927. He got on splendidly with Dali's family and appears in lots of photographs, drawings and paintings. In one photograph we see Lorca doing one of his favorite tricks, enacting his own death. Dali used the photograph to do one of his first paintings of the poet. Wonderful to 
see these paintings brought together in this, in this room, because I can see on the other wall another series of paintings from the same period, which one finds the fused heads of Lorca and Dali, relating to his deep friendship with Lorca, a friendship that for Lorca was, was intensely passionate, because Lorca by this time was in love with Dali. Dali, who was terrified of perhaps having homosexual tendencies himself, tended to be very guarded and always claimed afterwards that he hadn't allowed Lorca to possess him. But there's no doubt whatsoever that Lorca was passionately involved with Dali by this year, by the year of 1926. We see Lorca's head, his severed head, lying on the edge of the beach, sleeping peacefully or dead, we don't know. But it's a beach littered with severed members and suggestions of death, but done in a very nightmarish way with a stark precision. This is really a spectral beach. Then at the bottom of the picture, in the right-hand corner, is one of Dali's specialities, the rotting donkey, which, of course, reappears in the film he made with uh, Unuel, Un Chien Andalou. Dali himself was literally roped in to play one of the priests. When I met Dali, not long before he died, he said to me, my great friend Lorca, he hated women's breasts. I said, but maestro, I have the impression that you didn't particularly like women's breasts either. No, he said, but I paint them flying. I paint them flying in pairs. And here we have a splendid pair of flying breasts. Un Chien Dalou was first shown in Paris in 1929. All the surrealists saw it, including André Breton, the movement's founder. At that time, Dali was unknown to Breton. Uh, he hadn't uh, joined the surrealists. Breton came to this. Uh, Binuel said, uh, Dali wasn't here, I think. Binuel said he loaded up a lot of rocks behind the screen if the audience turned out he was going to throw them. Yes, yeah, a typical Aragonese gesture. Yes. Right? But on the other hand, it was an enormous success with the Tout Paris. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Breton was asked what he thought of it, and he said, it's, it's, it is a surrealist film. And from then on, Bunuel was a golden boy, and Dali soon joined him. Dali yes. was fanatic oh, about really? surrealism, and he applied the letter of the law. He did. I mean, hatred of family, well, he got himself thrown out. Hatred of religion in his, in his speeches. He attacks Catholicism as yes. nobody else was attacking Catholicism. Yes. And then the patrie, the fatherland, his no, scorn was for the country comes And of course he turned everything upside down on his head later and became in favour of family, <laughs> in favour of religion, <laughs> yeah. and so on. But at this moment, I think he probably uh, added uh, the great touches to the Andalusian dog. Uh, I mean, it's his imagination, one sees that in the pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vinoa was extremely bright and clever and funny, uh, but there is a fanaticism about those two early films that is not in the later Vinoa. I think there is a great deal of Dali in, in the first one. I film. think uh, Vinoa more or less acknowledges this, yeah. that Dali was a genius, but that he was also a swine. The trouble is when people come to write their memoirs, yes. uh, they, they tend to distort. Uh, maybe you find the same thing. <laughs> uh, and Buñuel is not trustworthy. None of them are really. Dali isn't trustworthy in The Secret oh, Life. certainly not. So you've got to go, if you can, to the correspondence and to contemporary documents, yes. to the newspapers. Mm. Because I've, what I've been trying to do is to get hold of the correspondence between uh, Buñuel and Noailles, and then between Dali and Buñuel. And yes. it's tricky. The difficulty is, is, is tracking down the contemporary documents, which yes. get closer to the truth, obviously. In the end, it's letters. Letters, yeah. It's not memoir. Dali was crazy about the Art Nouveau metro entrances in Paris. Uh, what he found out so wonderful about it was he said it was looked like edible architecture. You know, break a one. The Venetians. And one also sees the influence of it. I mean, he, he did know Barcelona also, of course. He was crazy about uh, Art Nouveau in general, or yeah. what, what he called the modern style. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But 
the see, style. the name is uh, is uh, represents a very important, of course, surrealist principle: the certainty of chance. The certainty I mean, of chance. I mean, here we are yeah. making a, a film a largely Boy. about Dali, Boy. and it immediately appears <laughs> on a tarpaulin. <laughs> Whatever Dali is, there is a happening. Dali joined the Surrealists because it was the most revolutionary movement around. It drew its inspiration from the individual unconscious and was socially subversive. Andre Breton was its high priest, and for a while at least, almost a second father to Dali. Breton had co-written one of the earliest Surrealist texts here in the Hôtel des Grands Hommes. Dali was drawn to the Surrealists, and for a while, they needed him. He came into Surrealism and revived it. It was dying on its feet. The painting was becoming duller and duller, more and more automatic. There were brilliant people like Miro and so on. And this young man who could spout uh, invention uh, very fast. And who Picasso, he went to see, said of Dali's mind, absolutely brilliant analogy. He said he's got a mind like an outboard motor. <laughs> uh, it is very good that. The mind did drive him. Yes, and Eloir called him a thinking machine that never stopped. Yes, incredible. And of course, uh, he's glamorous, I suppose, in the manner of the time. He looked like a gigolo, you know, with the popular looks. Flamboyant, and didn't mind what he did or said. And with, and with the daring of the timid, because... One of his surrealist friends was the poet Paul Eloir. Dali invited him and his wife Gala to cut a case, and it was love at first sight. All hell broke loose. Gala was a Russian mystery woman with a fabulous body who'd been in bed with everybody. Dali had been in bed with nobody. He was initiated by one of the most experienced people in the business. He was never the same after that moment. Is uh, Gala, who viene con Paul Eduard a Caracas, I abro la puerta y me la encuentro ya desnuda. Y entonces me enamoró automáticamente. Pero como que era muy tímido, como lo soy aún, y histérico, en el momento histérico porque nunca me había aún masturbado, o sea que llevaba una cantidad de retraso, de esperma incalculable. ¿Y cuántos años tenía? Ah, entonces tenía 22 años. Y ya que veníamos de gala, ¿qué le debe usted a gala? Todo. Absolutamente todo. Uh, hay una cosa, eso ya lo he dicho a la televisión, pero nadie lo cree. Es la única el, el, mujer que yo he hecho el amor. ¿Qué le debe usted a Gala como artista y como genius? Sobre todo el convencimiento que tengo ahora, gracias a ella, de que no soy tan mediocre como me lo creía. Porque ella creyó enseguida que tenía un gran talento. Y al contrario, creía que no. This is the Rue Becquerel in Montmartre at the foot of the Sacré Coeur. And it was here that Dali and Gala had their first love nest in Paris. The love nest was rented by Paul Eloir for him and Gala, but it was Dali who moved in. When the Dalis moved across town, they were visited by a young English writer, David Gascoigne, who was fascinated by surrealism and who translated some of Dali's most complicated texts. On an easel in the middle of the apartment was, the, here we are, the, the, the loaf of bread and oh, the uh, famous an inkwell uh, based on Millet's Angelus. This was, that was a feature of the studio. And another feature was a huge, well, pretty large canvas called the Great Masturbator, the Grand Masturbator. But, uh, Which must have, I imagine, struck you forcibly. <laughs> Well, it would strike anybody forcibly, yes. His interpretation of the Angelus of Millet is that the, the peasant woman is a praying mantis and the man with his hat here is hiding his erection. Uh, and, uh, the, well, anyway, it's uh, not so much an anti-religious uh, picture, but uh, it really was a sort of illustration of his obsessions. But he did have the most extraordinary technique and some of the paintings of that period uh, before he went to America, I think are of his greatest... Uh, I do remember him showing me uh, his brushes, and one of them had about three hairs, tiny hairs, a tiny little brush. And he really painted with great passion. 
Was he using a magnifying glass? Or? Yes, I think yes, indeed. Yes, he had a, a little, uh, you know, the kind that jurors use. He, he screwed into his eyes to, to do certain details. Really? He really had a complete mastery of uh, a representational technique. Daly said the idea of the melting watches in his painting The Persistence of Memory came to him one evening after he'd eaten a piece of camembert cheese. Gala had gone to the cinema, and when she returned, she just stood there. No one will ever forget it, she said. The world of dreams is a strange world, which most of us visit only in our sleep. The whole aim of surrealism is to explore this world and to bring it into relation with our daily life. Dali came to the London exhibition, the surrealist exhibition, which caused a tremendous stir in London, and, uh, and thousands and thousands of people came every day. The other great London experience for Dali was meeting his hero, Freud, in 1938. <laughs> asombrado y dijo a Stefan Zweig, nunca he visto un prototipo de español más claramente. Es un fanático. Esa es la palabra de Freud. Dali had been reading Freud with fascination since the early 1920s, when Freud began to be published in Madrid. So that when he got to Paris in 1929, it could be said that he knew as much about him as the surrealists themselves. And Gala was also an avid disciple. Ella tenía un cuerpo también bueno, pero todo eso, todo eso no daba la, la sensación de una mujer con personalidad y, y inteligente ni nada de eso. Así la recuerdo yo. Era mayor que Dalí. ¿eh? Tenía unos ojos pequeños de gata. Era muy muy es especial su mirada. Le transformó, claro, y entonces empezó a leer los libros del Marqués de Sade y cuando vino a nuestra casa tenía todos los mm, tirantes con escenas del Marqués de Sade. ¿Cómo? ¿Los tirantes? ¿Los tirantes? ¿No? Sí, sí. ¿Con dibujos? ¿Con dibujos? ¿Pero hechos por él? No sé con dibujos, y yo dije, ¿pero qué te has hecho ahí? Dice, son muy bonitos. Ah, pero son dibujos eróticos. Claro, el marqués de Sade, ¿cómo van a ser? Dali's mother died of cancer when he was only 16, and shortly after, his father married the dead woman's sister. From that moment on, it seems that Dali's relationship with his father became more and more difficult. This painting is very important because it's the painting that got Dali thrown out of his home by his father. It's a painting he exhibited in Paris at the end of the 1920s. And it's a figure of God, the Father Almighty, and here's the Sacred Heart. And Dali has written in French, sometimes I spit for fun on the portrait of my mother. It's one of the oddest portraits of a mother ever executed. It was terrible, a terrible uh, shock to the father because the mother had, had died in 1921, <clears throat> eight or nine years earlier. And it was a terrible family tragedy. So really the most sacred aspect of that family was, was the mother and to spit on the portrait of the mother in the guise of God the Father Almighty was a dreadful insult and Daddy's father simply threw him out. Daddy was determined not to be pushed out of the area by his tyrannical father. So he bought a fisherman's cottage just over the hill in Portigat and in direct opposition to him, settled down there with Gala. 
Over the years, he expanded the property with the addition of adjoining cottages. Dali painted the Bay of Port Ligat over and over again. It was one of the places he most loved in the world. And what must most have delighted him was that Port Ligat and its bay received the first sunlight in Spain. Dali's father and sister are buried in the little cemetery of San Baldiri, halfway between Cadaqués and Port Ligat. The irony is that the cemetery looks down on Salvador Dali's house, which incredibly they were never able to visit. Pero no, porque ellos eran de allí y ella estaba a la rima de su padre. Ella no dejó nunca el sitio de su padre allí. Sí, sí, este fue el dominio de, de Salvador. Y hay otra razón para la que no viniera, era también el dominio de Gala. Por y por eso no podía venir la Pero es patético, Rafael. ¿no? Patético, muy patético. El padre, y Ana María Dalí Domenech, la hija, incluso estuve invitado por ellos en su casa. Aquí conservo un gran, gran recuerdo. Era una persona excepcional, el padre muy enérgico, muy fuerte de carácter, pero al mismo tiempo era una persona muy cordial, muy amena, muy, muy recibiendo siempre muy bien a los amigos y a las personas. Adoraba a su hijo, adoraba a su hijo, pero es esa relación de amor-odio que se da a veces en las relaciones paternofiliales, ¿no? Dalí amaba a su padre extraordinariamente. Lo temía porque era muy autoritario, pero precisamente lo admiraba porque veía en él lo que a él le faltaba, esa autoridad que él quería tener igual que el padre, pero no conseguía imponerla como quería. Y Ana María Dalí, la sombra de, de su hermano continuamente, que también adoraba a su hermano, estaba enamorada de su hermano y también es la tragedia de Salvador. Salvador destruía todo lo que quería, las cosas que escribió de su hermana, el poema El Amor, El Amemoir, es de las cosas más horribles que un hermano puede escribir de una hermana. Dali was determined to shock, as was his friend Luis Buñuel. And the film they were working on together, L'Age d'Or, set out to do this on the grand scale. A drink at the screen. They beat up uh, members of the audience with clubs. Yes. And they destroyed everything in the foyer. Exactly what surrealism always claimed. It loved to, to actually irritate and annoy its enemies so much that they actually turned to violence. The opening scene was shot at Cap Creus, just around the corner from Port Ligat, and one of the most remarkable places on the whole Mediterranean. <laughs> Dali called Creus the crossroads of the winds of Catalonia, a place of optical illusions where weird metamorphoses take place before our eyes and the rocks inspired some of Dali's most arresting images. Again, the hidden face of shame. Elsewhere, the rocks assume human features, expressing the conflicts in his life at the time, with his father, his sister, with sexuality, and of course, with the Catholic Church. This is a, uh, a sort of idealized or stylized version of the head of the father, leering with sort of sexual lechery at what's going on in this group. On his shoulder is resting a figure who appears to be ashamed, because he was terrified of sex and ashamed of his, it had been instilled into him as a child, and he never fully got free from it. As you can see, this is the, the host and the chalice, and there's blood at the center of the host. And Dali is sort of spitting, but the spit is a sort of saliva, which I think, in his mind, is a symbol of sperm. What Dali has done is to turn a supreme symbol of faith in the Christian message into a symbol of horror. Because one of the most disgusting things anybody could do, any Christian could do, 
to the sacred cup and to the sacred host would be to uh, masturbate over them. And that is what, in fact, is happening in this painting, although it may be unrecognized by many people who look at it. It was not long before Dali began to offend the Surrealists themselves. Things came to a head in January 1934, when Breton summoned Dali to Rue Fontaine to answer the charge of being pro-Hitler. So this was the entrance to the Sanctu Sanctorum. Dali was called to heel because he'd started to paint Hitler a lot, and went on and on about the great paranoia of Berchtesgaard. And of course, the Surrealists were violently anti-Nazi. So they called him a sort of kangaroo court in uh, the Rue de Fontaine. And uh, they were all there. Uh, Jean was there. He said that if Dali had performed as he did that day on the music hall, he would have made a fortune. He appeared claiming he had a bad cold and wearing 12 sweaters, which he alternatively took off and put on, taking his temperature all the time, <laughs> taking his socks off and on, while they were all saying, why do you paint Hitler? And then, in this moment, I declared myself apolitical totalmente, pero al mismo tiempo monárquico y anarquista, pero no políticamente, metafísicamente. Dali's politics were always ambiguous. This 1936 painting, soft construction with boiled beans, was strategically retitled Premonition of Civil War, a war in which Dali favored General Franco from a safe distance. Dali and Gala spent the three years of the Spanish Civil War in Paris. But when the Germans invaded France, they made a beeline for New York. He'd already made several successful visits, and now it seemed not only a haven of safety, but also a potential pot of gold. about the enormous success and final decline of Salvador Dali, one of the best known and controversial artists of the 20th century. Dali died in 1989. His personality had become as well known as his paintings. But this is also a film made during the writing of a biography about Salvador Dali by the Irish author, Ian Gibson. And the great man himself. Bonjour, Senor Dali. Como estamos? The problem for any biographer is to separate fact from fiction. Particularly difficult with someone like Dali, who loved to cultivate confusion. Soy muy mal pintor, por la razón de que soy demasiado inteligente para ser buen pintor. Para ser buen pintor hay que ser un poco burro. Un día que Dalí hiciera un cuadro bien hecho como Velázquez o como Vermeer o como Rafael, la semana siguiente uno se muere. Y entonces yo prefiero hacer malos y vivir más tiempo. At the beginning of World War II, Salvador Dali and his wife Gala fled to New York, where he was already famous. They stayed first in the house of their wealthy American friend, Caress Crosby. Salvador Dali spent about a whole year at my place in Virginia. I had a lovely deer park that went with Hampton Manor, also a pond down at the end of the garden. 
that was overgrown. And uh, he decided that it would be a very good idea to make a real production of this. So we hauled the piano up into the tree. Americans loved Dali's looks, they loved his wit, they loved his paintings, and they loved everything about the man. And of course, he just loved their dollars. Dali was taken up by the wealthy and decided that the quickest way to make big money was to paint society portraits. What could be more novel to wealthy Americans than to see themselves meticulously portrayed in slick, surrealist settings? He now yearned for a Hollywood breakthrough and got it with Alfred Hitchcock. It seemed to be a gambling house. But there weren't any walls, just a lot of curtains with eyes painted on them. A man was walking around with a large pair of scissors cutting all the drapes in half. I requested uh, Darley. Selznick, the producer, had the impression that I wanted Darley for the publicity value. Yeah. That wasn't it at all. What I was after was, again, the thing we talked about earlier, the vividness of dreams. As you know, all Darley's work is very solid and very sharp, with very long perspectives and, and black shadows. Uh, actually, I wanted the dream sequences to be shot on the back lot, not in the studio at all. Mm. I wanted them shot in the bright sunshine so the cameraman would be forced to what we call stop down and get a very hard image. This was, again, the avoidance of the cliché. All dreams in movies are blurred. It isn't true. Darley was the best man for me to do the dreams because that's what dreams should be. Earlier, Dali had tried to collaborate with the Marx Brothers and later with Walt Disney. But to his great disappointment, both projects fell through. He and Gallo returned to New York. Well, it's a nice, uh, quiet location. <laughs> it's a nice, quiet location in the middle of Fifth Avenue. Dali was crazy about New York, unlike his friend, the poet Lorca, who was very frightened by the place. Dali loved it and decided to become the king. And I think he certainly achieved that. Lorca fled to Cuba, but Dali stayed for 40 years. La luna es un pozo chico, que la luna no va a ver. Pero te vas a ver con tus brazos, cuando de noche me abrazas, García Lorca. Whenever he came here, he stayed in the St. Regis, and he always stayed in the same suite. Unfortunately, the place has changed, they, they're not letting us into film. The King Cole Bar is in another bit of the building. It's still there, but it looks different. And uh, that's where Dali's court used to gather. His friends, his hangers-on, the beautiful people, the businessmen, the wheeler dealers, a lot of them. And this is where it all uh, happened. I've, I've been told you met him in the men's urinals in the St. Regis Hotel. Is that true? <laughs> that is a No, a because legend. we both met him, and I certainly wasn't you in there. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have suspected was... <laughs> such a thing of you, Ellen. <laughs> you know, we showed him a, a pa painting that we, had been sold to us, and and, uh, and then we took it to Dali for verification of myself. You, you did Myself is like these paintings. It's a good painting, but myself is never do. <laughs> years to get the collection together. Mm -hmm. I would, somebody would go to sell one and I would finally track it down. When you're captured by the magic of Dali, why, uh, it's pretty hard to back out. I mean, once you get bitten by the Dali bug. When did you first start buying all his works? Oh, about 1942. This collection came from people all over the world that I got in touch with, talked, corresponded, and then somebody they'd want to sell a picture and we'd buy it. And in the end, we ended up with 95 dollars paintings. No, it's incredible what you've done. And if you had to sort of do a sort of detective sure, Many job. of you are wondering why a Spaniard has a museum in Florida, in the USA. And it's quite simple, actually. The collector is Mr. and Mrs. 
Morris, um, on their first wedding anniversary, had decided to buy a painting by Dali. We just fell in love with these things. The wonderful draftsmanship, the deep perspective, the beautiful colors, and even the strange ideas were new to us, and we loved them. And that was why we tried to buy a Dali. My father thought that we were going to go crazy, and he'd have to end by supporting us if we kept on wasting our money this way when he saw the painting. Because in that era, this painting was very shocking. <laughs> what, did, what did he say when he saw us? <laughs> I don't think he said anything. He was speechless. <laughs> it's obvious that that is a good idea. Table. <laughs> we should all use our legs as table. <laughs> and one time, we were over there trying to find the exact spots that Dali had used to do these marvelous paintings. Mm -hmm. And we found this place on the hill going up from Port Lagarde and asked Dali, and he said, yes, this is where it was. And uh, so then Dali posed for us. Did you go to Cap Creus with Dali? Did yes. he take you on a trip? Yeah, we've been around with him. In Gala. Gala. Oh. And it was very rough that day, as I remember, yeah. when we were coming around the point going into the bay. I didn't like it very much. <laughs> And he loved, he loved to talk about esoteric things and tried to, th tried to make us look, you know, stupid that we didn't know things. And we didn't know many, many things. We spent years under Dolly's tutelage, and gradually we learned a lot. Did he, did he tease you? I mean, did he? he oh, yeah. Did he? Yes. How did he tease you? He loved, he loved it when I made mistakes. And I, I said, this is Portuguese. Or Port and he said, that's not Portuguese. He said, you're stupid. Now, I feel very privileged to be looking at one of your diaries. No, no, no. No, I, no, I feel very privileged. Well, I'd not many been, eyes have seen this document. No, I think that Dolly was talking about. Sure. Get, get the books he was <laughs> reading. And he, it's been a university for you, really, a sort of university course, being in such close contact to Dolly. Oh, God, yes. Because he, as you say, he mentioned a book, you went away. To my surprise, Moss opened his massive Dolly diary for me. Welcome to go through them, because there's no secret. This is my original a biographer's book. dream. Mm -hmm. It spans decades and is yeah. full of witty and incisive so comments yeah. about Dali's day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Your trips, where you went. Do you, do you Talk to him on the telephone. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Do you paste in correspondence, that sort of thing? It's also terrific about all the people the Morses met during their trips to Cadacase. Captain Peter Moore began to work for Dali in the 1950s. Oh, Dali behind the wheel is something I've never seen because he never was behind the wheel of anything. And M Mrs. Dolly, who is there, is, uh, is a, seems to be very worried. The head was uh, made in Paris for a television commercial for Chocolat Lanvin. Je suis fou! Du chocolat l'envers. This isn't really a sort of traditional museum, is it? No, no. It's more a private collection which is on view to people who are interested. The museum would be pompous. This joint creation of Moore and his wife is tangible evidence of the personal benefits that could accrue from being Dali's loyal servant. You met Dali first in Rome, if I'm right. Yes, yeah. Can you tell me about that meeting? Well, I was living in Rome and working for a gentleman called Sir Alexander Corda. That was in 1955. And Dali liked the idea of having an aide-de-camp. He liked the idea that you were a military man. Uh, military advisor was my title. Military advisor? No. no. We, went to, we went to lunch at the United Nations, and I sat next to him, and somebody says, who is this one? He says, my military advisor. <laughs> he liked the fact that you'd been in, in intelligence. Mm -hmm. No, no, I had not been in intelligence. Mm. I'd been in psychological warfare, which is not the same kettle of fish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Got that one wrong. But he felt that having been in psychological warfare, you'd be in a strong position to, to protect him to, against to, his many yes, potential certainly. enemies. Not only that, but to amplify his uh, talent. But the, the Dali Circus hit the road with Moore as ringmaster. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait,
Watching it all in the 60s was Andy Warhol, who acknowledged Dali as the great pioneer of the happening and the cult of personality, and of the gains to be made from the blurring of the boundary between an artist and his work. Gala continued to control the paintings, but Moore looked after everything else, from graphics and advertising spreads to designs for jewelry. Well, it was designed for me by Salvador Dali, and um, it's made of uh, the green peridots and diamonds. And uh, Dali says that uh, they are, everything comes from the, from the sky, the water comes from the sky. And you yourself, you got a 10% on everything you set up, all the deals you set 10 up. 10% mm -hmm. and I paid my own expenses. And I had no contract. You made a few million. I made 10% of 32 million. Pretty good. Moore confirmed Dali's instinct for the link between art and showbiz. And this commercial jamboree is still going on. You worked with Dali for, for 20 years. You got to know him tremendously well. What, in your opinion, drove the man? Fame. Not money. Well, why did he need fame so desperately? Because it opens every door. Because uh, it's... Uh, it's a, once you've known fame, you, uh, you become an addict. He hated people. Well, there must be something that he hated. Uh, arse lickers. Uh, no. He liked arse lickers. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, let me see. Uh, ugly people. He never thought he was good looking. He thought he was interesting looking. And uh, he would put on wigs and make the moustaches a little longer by cutting a piece of his hair and putting a little a little pomade, but he looked good uh, when he was dressed up, he looked good. He never thought he was a handsome man, but he thought he was an interesting looking man. That's his own opinion of himself. The first question that I wanted to put you, it really ought to be about modern art, but I can't help it. There's some delicious frivolity in you which makes me ask it is, how did you manage to produce those marvelous moustaches? have any trouble with it at night? I mean, do you have to peg it or anything like that, or does it stand up at night? No, in the night, uh, clean every night. Mm. They come in, soft, uh, sleep. So at night it droops down completely, while you're sleeping? Completely, completely. And then in the morning, up she goes again? Three minutes. Only in three minutes, fix my moustache. And then you feel you can face the world with that one form of star standing up? Yes, because uh, every day becoming much more practical for my inspiration. I'm so fascinated yeah. to know that. After the explosion of the first atom bomb in 1945, Dali's painting and self-promotion began to draw heavily and very idiosyncratically on first nuclear physics and soon after DNA and the origins of life. Because of my self-belief, contrary to the modern atomic age, is very gay. No, nothing is more gay the collision and explosion of intra-atomic conflicts of nuclear physics. It's, it's, you feel that that really livens things up enormously. Uh, for me, is the more happy thing is look at these terrific conflicts about electrons and pinnesons and atoms. Mm. Is everything jumping and rumping in a completely extraordinary eurythmic feeling. Mm. The one new kind of... Uh, atomic and nuclear mysticism. Well, thank you very much. That's a fascinating phrase, nuclear mysticism. Eso es seguro. Pero como he dicho muchas veces, esos otros mundos están en el nuestro. Residen en la Tierra y precisamente en el centro de la cúpula del Museo Dalí donde hay todo el nuevo mundo insospechado y alucinante del surrealismo. In 1961, Dali decided that he wanted to project his ideas into an original three-dimensional space. In the shell of the Teatro Principal in his hometown of Figueras, where he had held his first exhibition as an adolescent, 
he decided to create his own extraordinary museum. It was to be a combination of theatre and art gallery, with the stress on surprise and entertainment. There wouldn't even be any explanatory labels. The project took 10 years to complete. Today, it's a major tourist attraction for visitors to the Costa Brava. At the museum, I talked to the second most important woman in Dali's life. Nanita Kalashnikov is not a Russian, but a Spaniard from Madrid. She met Dali in New York in the 1950s, and they became lifelong friends. Dali nicknamed her Louis XIV, Louis XIV, on account of her regal bearing. Did he arrive on time for oh, appointment? Never, never, never. never had a watch? Never, never, but he was never, never, never one minute late. Never, never. So I'm, he so, was... I'm so sorry now that he had to wait for so long for me because I'm always late. But he didn't, he didn't mind because he loved, you know, he had so much to think about and, and he was taking, you know. So he loved to wait for somebody. You knew Dali intimately. After Gala, you're the woman that Dali most loved. Do you think you know what really drove him as a human being? What it was that really made him be Dali, to make him do the things he did, to paint yes. the things he did? Oh, yes, because we spoke very much about it, very often. Tried to explain to me, probably trying to explain it to himself, trying to discover, you know, why he was like that, and uh, telling me about his uh, childhood and his youth which made all that he was, like all of us. Because as he was, as I say, he was quite shy and he didn't want, you know, to perform like that at all. And he knew I didn't, I didn't like it at all, so he always said, I know you didn't like me this afternoon when I did that, but I have to because if I was, a, you know, the real little Dali, shy and be nothing, it was his, uh, you know, curtain. Your eccentricity that you are... Uh, I keep it back. Mm -hmm. Everybody talk about eccentricity. It's a little true, but I am total and absolutely paradoxical. Men, yeah, it's true, I am eccentric, but in the same time, I am concentric. Mm. Nanita often posed for Dali and appears, for example, in the Apotheosis of the Dollar. The huge painting was executed in Port Ligat with the aid of pulleys. It's quite interesting because it has a, you know, it had a hole on the floor and the painting was going down. I don't know how he could do oh. the hole. See, oh. he, did, he never had the whole thing. He never saw the whole thing. It was just by far. It's lovely. <laughs> It was, was it on a sort of pulley going up and down into Yes, a... going down, completely uh -huh. down on the, you know, on the yeah. second floor. So he could never see, so it was quite a surprise when we saw it, you know, at the end, the whole thing. Dali spent his summers in Port Ligat. Should I show you the door to the... Um, yeah. ...to the library? Unfortunately, the house was empty and closed when we were filming. Carlos Lozano, part of Dali's entourage in the 1970s, remembers it in its heyday. Down this gate here is a little beach where Dali once kept swans. They were eaten by foxes. They didn't last very long, but they were very pretty to look at. This is where Dali held court. This would be the throne. There was a wooden sculpture here and he'd be sitting here in the middle. Why don't you sit down? Let's have a look. He would be what, sitting, what like? yeah. sitting sort of like this, with his cane looking out, you know, with his eyes glowing, and everybody would be sort of serving him or trying to find out what would please him the most. He was very imperial at one part of his life. He was just very uh, demanding so, without asking. So he was surrounded by, by the beautiful people? Yes, preferably androgynous types he loved the most where they were sort of angelic, where according to Dali, they had no sex. The angel is sexless. Therefore, it was very attractive to him to be surrounded by a court of 
sexless creature. Yes. My research established that Amanda Lear originally performed under the stage name of Piki Doslo in Le Carousel, a famous drag club in Paris. April Ashley, Britain's first self-declared transsexual and one of the club's stars, published this picture in her book. Dali uh, was fascinated by you, but he was also fascinated by the whole sex change aspect of your life. I mean, it's ridiculous to deny that because April Ashley's book is there. Yes, I, I, you I read my asking about that? Yes, I read her book and I, I couldn't understand why she made up so many stories in her book. And suddenly, people came up and say, uh, ah, you were a sex changer. I said, it's a good story, let's keep it, you know. And, and in fact, Salvador Dali, who adored to scandalize the bourgeois, he adored to shock people, mm. jumped on it, said, great, yeah, let's, you know, he already, he already was talking to Louis XIV uh, in a masculine way. It was he, the same thing, a nice lady with three daughters, you know, there was absolutely no hint of sex change in her. <laughs> but again, he was referring to her as he, and all the girls, including Gala, were he. So Amanda Lee was also he for Dali. And people would say, ah, that's because she's a sex change, you know, and he called her he. I said, no, nothing to do with that. It's just that Dali called everybody he. He loved the body of a, of a man. He was always surrounded by beautiful, uh, beautiful boys and uh, beautiful bodies. And, but uh, he didn't like, I mean, he didn't like men. There's no doubt in your mind. That I know, no doubt at all. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. No. No, no. He would have been with Garcia Lorca if he would have been homosexual because Garcia Lorca adored him and he, he loved uh, Garcia Lorca. ...and his boys and his girls and his orgies and these things. I mean, did, did Gala ever get involved in any of that? No. Well, uh, no, because the happenings were very, very, sort of very innocent. And I think she was less innocent than that. I mean, her happenings were real happenings. <laughs> yeah. And our happenings were completely crazy, <laughs> mental, not... You disappoint, you disappoint me. I thought they were better than that. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, well, they were quite good. <laughs> but, 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 the preparation, the preparation was... But you're, you're, the you're, preparation too, was... you're two very liberated people, so maybe what you think is good. No, but the preparation was much more yeah, important the than the thing. Much, so. and, and to talk about it the day after. Mm -hmm. much more. <laughs> and, and then by when the thing had to happen, it was so late that everyone was tired. <laughs> no. No, no, uh, Gala, Gala was, was much not more tired. To the <laughs> Gala was to the more point. serious, yes. I see. <laughs> when Gala wanted uh, somebody, she really went for him. She did, she did. She did. Uh, Gala needed privacy for a constant succession of young lovers. So Dali decided to restore for her a broken-down mansion in the village of Pubo, about 50 miles inland from Port Ligat. Here for several summers, Gala ruled supreme. The story is that Dali was only allowed to visit her if he had her written permission. Only with written invitation. From your wife? For, for, for my, and Dali is every day more masochist and of tremendous discondition. He was telling me that the only woman he ever actually did it with was Gala, his wife. Yeah. And I said, well, then you know how it is. He said, no, and it's not even how you think. It's completely different. I said, why? Oh, what's so special? You know? <laughs> he said, no, no, you don't realize with Gala, it's something else. She's the one and only woman that I ever had sex with. Mm proper sex. Had, I mean, in the past tense. Oh, yeah, and, uh, mm. and that's it, and nobody else. He was not a, a very well-balanced man. Also, he kept saying, I have a thermostat that makes me always in a good mood, you know, like a thermostat. But uh, I've seen him also in very bad mood and with fear and anxieties and ups and downs. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been a creative painter. All the things he was doing were to exercise madness. He was acting mad in order to exercise madness. And gaze upon its ample cloth, creased 2,000 <laughs> years. Are the creased feeling? No more creased. Oh, no. The court, of course, is an imaginary court which he has invented for his own uh, enjoyment. And every now and then we have make, uh, make new appointments. When Peter Moore, the chief courtier, left, his place was taken by Enrique Sabater, 
a highly ambitious young Catalan photographer, footballer, journalist, pilot, businessman and general factotum, who'd begun to take pictures of Dali in the 1960s. I eventually managed to track him down at one of his luxurious villas. Sabater is one of the most controversial figures in the story of Dali's last years. You know much more things than myself about me. I, I'm only interested in the, in the truth, you know. Yes, but biographers, you are dangerous. Are you frightened? No, I am not. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might blacken your name. No, Some people think you're a monster, uh, Senor Sabater. Some people think you're a sort of monster, and that basically you didn't really like uh, Dali. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> this is the first time. It's funny, it's funny what to say. Uh, I think I always have proof to have much more respect to Mr. Dali than many other people. Such as? Hmm? Which, which people? Any names? Well, uh, many. There are so many names that uh, this interview mm. will finish never. <laughs> <laughs> I thought That's you were going to say it's over now. <laughs> <laughs> but your successor was, according to Gala, better looking than you, Enrique Sabatello. Ah, no. She said he was uh, more intelligent, younger, and better looking. In that order? In that order. So I said, listen, uh, as I have to leave you anyway, because I have to have an operation, so I said, uh, you, you know, you're... you're Bienvenue, bienvenue. <laughs> he also took a smaller percentage. But, so yes, he did a half price. But he, he did it half price, but it cost him ten times more. So I don't know how, hmm. how that worked out. Peter Moore's story is that he got a 10% commission. And you said you do the same job for 5%. Who, who said that? Peter Moore. He doesn't know nothing about me. Uh. You've said frequently to uh, interviewers that when you left Ali, he had 32 million Dollars. dollars in the bank. And that when he died, he had nothing. When he died, he owed money. So he was taken to the cleaners by somebody. As a biographer, I found myself listening to endless accusations and counter accusations, in my view, largely stemming from Dali and Gala's indifference to ethical considerations. And did you make a lot of money very quickly for Dali and for yourself? Of course, mm. of course. For that reason, some people think I am a monster. So uh, you, you got at least 10% commission? More than that, because Mr. Moore was doing only the contest for etchings, graphic works, and contest for uh, TV show or something like that, but never in the oil paintings and everything. I can only make a statement that when I, when I left him, he was rich, and when they buried him, he was poor. The While I'm playing, the role of the valet. Can you? Exactly. Everybody is my slave. Yes. No. 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 Everybody is not. Everybody. No. 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 Out. The people don't like it becoming my slave. No more. Oh, Put on the can't I have another role besides? All right. All right. All right. I will finish. I wasn't very interested in Salvador Dali because he was known among my friends in the visual arts as this sort of sellout, this commercial former genius who basically was involved only in his own exploitation of his uh, ability to market himself, whatever. Didn't interest me. I went to the cocktail reception. He was very taken by meeting me physically, sort of his eyes kind of popped out of his head as they frequently did. I had learned later from Gala, later that week I think, that he was fascinated because I looked at the age of 32 very much like his father. The real reason why they needed Michael Stout was that the U.S. tax authorities were onto them. The Dallies had to find someone competent and sympathetic, and Stout was also an expert on copyright law. In the early part of 1976, they received a notice from the Internal Revenue Service that a criminal investigation was commencing into their tax situation, and that was very serious. Salvador Dali, myself, is very rich, and Dali loved tremendously money and gold. Money was simply the oil that greased the wheel of their life. It wasn't about saving or accumulating or using money for power. They weren't interested in intelligent investment advice. I was just going to ask you if they didn't invest, did they? I mean, 
basically, Gala was the type that wanted the money under the mattress or in the safe deposit box or in the bank or something. The Dalis were people who believed that a $5,000 check should be deposited in person in the bank, even if it meant spending $6,000 on the air ticket to the depository. Politically, Dali offended many people by his public support for General Franco. What do you think about Franco, for example? Uh, Franco is perhaps the only intelligent man today in, in politics. But he hasn't uh, solved the, the acute problem of poverty in Spain, for example. Ah, but my son likes poverty. You like poverty? Yes, yeah. because uh, uh, like the Inquisition and poverty is necessary uh, for only the people is happy can is completely compressed by Inquisition. But soon his support anchor turned sour. In 1975, the aging general executed five alleged terrorists, three of them Basques. Dali thought that the general had done a good thing. Maybe he should have executed just a few more. The papers picked this up, and suddenly Dali was terrified. Then some death threats arrived, uh, people hurled stones through his windows, and Dali simply decided there was only one thing to do, and that one thing was to flee. And for the first time in his life, he boarded an aeroplane. We flew to, to Geneva, and there <coughs> in the street, he tripped and he fell. And that was very symptomatic, because Dali never fell. That's why I saw him on the floor, picking himself up, and suddenly he looked so pathetic, you know, and, and gauche and old. And, and I said, no, there is something changing. I could see there was something changing there. And that was really the beginning of the end, you know, after that sabbate, the problem, the taxes, the, the willing and dealing. I don't know what they did, you know, but um, it wasn't the same, Dali, from now on. Suddenly, Sabatea carried a gun. I mean, the Dalis never had someone walking around them with a gun. Uh, and it, there was a climate of fear. But nothing could protect Dali from his greatest fear, old age. His health was declining. And in January 1980, Gala and Dali returned to Spain from the USA, seriously ill. I was in the Theatre Museum the afternoon in October 1980 when Dali staged a pathetic comeback. I asked him about his relationship with Lorca and he muttered a conventional reply. The old fire gone. It was clear to me and everyone there that neither had long to live. But then you believe in God? Creo en Dios, pero no tengo la fe. Por las matemáticas y por las ciencias particulares, sé que es indiscutible que Dios tiene que existir. Pero no me lo creo. Y eso es terrible. Cada vez me acerco más, pero no me lo creo. ¿Te gustaría creérselo? Ah, entonces todo estaría resuelto. Sobre todo el problema de la muerte. Porque yo tiemblo de pensar en la muerte. Cuando Gala died en 1982, Dali was like an abandoned child. D Dali stayed on in her castle, refusing to leave. Two years later, he had to, after being badly burned when his bed caught fire. After Dali uh, was suddenly left all alone, you know, in football, something very strange happened. He, it's been going on already quite a few months before even Gala died. He didn't. He, he hated himself. Dali, I never could have, I never could Im imagine that Dali would end up like this. He was saying to people, give me a gun, I want to shoot myself, I'm going to shave my moustache, I don't want to be Dali anymore, I don't want to paint anymore. I, uh, it's like everything that he had built, he, he was rejecting. He wanted uh, to be left alone. Certainly all the friends, you know, Kalashnikov, or all the friends have called and said, Dali, do you need us? We know you are now in a moment of need. You know, you need your friends. No, leave me alone, leave me alone. He wouldn't take anybody on the phone. That was it. And uh, most of his friends got very hurt from this. You know, they said, come on, I mean, we are your friend. We are here for you. Now you need us. You've been so generous to us. You've been so good. No, no, no. And, and so his entourage started uh, building a wall around. After his operation for Burns, Dali was installed in a tower of his museum in Figueras. He never returned to Portligat, 
and arguments still rage about what happened to some of the contents of the house. A ver, a ver, cuando muere Gala. Sí, a partir de Gala, no vuelve nunca, da, no vuelve nunca, nunca más. ni una sola vez. Ni una sola vez. ¿Y qué pasó con todos los papeles y los libros y ah, todo? Pues no lo sabemos. No lo sabemos. Pero han desaparecido. Sí. No se sabe dónde ahí, están. Ahí se estuvo su secretario de entonces, el señor de Charne, se estuvo ese verano con sus hijos viviendo aquí, utilizando toda esta casa. Es decir, que no y se... él iba a venir allá a mí. Eh, una esta persona de este hotel de aquí me ha dicho que le veía pasar cada semana que llevaba una maleta. Y a, entonces le preguntó una vez, le digo, ¿y cómo? ¿Y qué hace usted que se lleva esta maleta? Y dice, ah, no, sa, sé que llevan por tesa, a pagar por la fotografía, sa, te, me sé tal que me ha dado la permisión. Yo le digo, pero ¿cómo no le decía a usted que aquí hay mejor luz que en París para fotografiarlo? Robert Deschamps. A French photographer and long-standing friend of the Dalis became their last secretary. A very controversial figure in Spain, he's the author of several books on Dali, lavishly illustrated. He has refused to help with this biography, and he's refused to collaborate in any way on this film. Con el paso de los años, los temblores se agravaron hasta tal punto que en 1986 la firma de Dali aparece con este trazo debajo de un importante contrato de cesión de derechos de autor a su colaborador Robert de Charnes. The Spanish government of the day ratified the contract, giving De Mart, the foreign company set up by De Charnes, control of Dali's copyright for almost 20 years. Many of Dali's associates are still unhappy about the situation. I'm not going to tell you nothing. There was also controversy about Dali's last will. Will you talk about? But I will tell you. Enrique Sabater had helped to prepare an earlier one. Mr. and Mrs. Dali, they spent seven months every day taking myself the notes for seven in order to make the last and uh, definitely will themselves and what was in the the wills that they drew up at that time the one of the seven month mm. aside yeah that uh, everything will belong to spain through the Theater Museo in Figueras. Todo lo que yo poseo y que puedo poseer, lo voy a dar al Estado español. Dali's declarations never contained the whole truth. In fact, an earlier will had divided the legacy equally between his native Catalonia and the rest of Spain. Dali died in 1989. Dali had asked for his face to be covered when he died, but that request was not respected. At the very last moment, before the coffin lid was to be screwed down, his most faithful retainer, Artur Caminana, did cover his face, weeping with a cloth. <laughs> The awful thing is Artur Caminada didn't receive a single peseta in Dali's will, and he was heartbroken, heartbroken. And one wonders, as a biographer, one reflects over a man's life, what value Dali actually gave to feelings of loyalty, of, of love, of tenderness. <laughs> There was even controversy about where he was to be buried. Y Dalí quiso que se dejaron una una ventana mirando al norte a la mano derecha de Gala para que cuando Dalí se muriera pues se pudieran dar las manos. Usted tiene la convicción total de que Dalí quería estar aquí enterrado al lado de de Gala. Sí sí. Dalí me firmó porque yo lo necesitaba un papel de que eh, o pedían la autorización para hacer la tumba de Gala y Dalí para estar juntos el resto de, de la eternidad. But a few hours before Dalí died, the mayor of Figueres made a surprise announcement. He alleged that Dalí had told him a month earlier that he now wanted to be buried in his museum. Of course he'd be sorry not to be Gala, but uh, he, I'm sure that he wanted to be at, in the museum. It's amazing for a painter like that to die, you know, in the, in the museum and to live there in a room 
you know, like that. He could see all the people coming and going. So I'm sure that he, that that's the place where he, he wanted to be. What an irony, after all the controversy surrounding Dali's burial in this theater, they don't even realize he's there under that slab, he's standing there looking around. Nobody realizes that Dali is under that slab. And to see his tomb, you've got to go down this way. out of the loos and into this little sort of crypt surrounded by tawdry things, late Dali works. And there is the slab covering the tomb of the great man. Hardly anybody seems to notice it any more than they notice the slab upstairs. And here lies the man who was terrified of death all his life. His title, of course, was given to him by the King of Spain, by Juan Carlos. <laughs> Tomorrow night on Bravo Profiles, the Surrealist Week continues. What Hemingway was to literature, Frida Kahlo was to the art world. Bravo Profiles Mexico's vivacious artistic firebrand, Frida Kahlo. That's tomorrow night. But next on Bravo, before all those buddy pictures with Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau took a stab at dashing action hero in the offbeat thriller, Charlie Varick. That's coming up next.